Support for Carolina Business Review made possible by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. When the late retail icon and former four-term Charlotte Mayor John Belk was asked why it was so important to develop Charlotte's Douglas Airport on the west side of the city, he said, and I quote, well, that's where the planes land. <laughs> I love that quote. Welcome to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy for the last 20 years now. I'm Chris William, and on this installment of CBR, what is it about the airline business model that makes them such public enemy? And how do centers of air transportation, separate from airlines, shape the future of our air travel and our community's development? Among many other questions, that's where we will start, and we start in just a moment. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded June 24, 2011. On this week's program, Jerry Orr, Aviation Director of the Charlotte Douglas International Airport, and Dave Edwards, Executive Director of the Greenville Spartanburg International Airport. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, gentlemen, happy summer. Dave, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, Mr. Orr, it's nice to have you back on the program. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 you gentlemen, both. Uh, you know, Jerry, I, I want to start with you. Let's start pretty philosophically and broadly. How is it? Is it a problem that people, when people walk into airports, they normally don't think of the airport, they think of the airlines. How do you separate your brand, in, in this case in Charlotte, Charlotte Douglas, how do you separate it out from, well, who, the lion's share of the gate, which is U.S. Airways, how do you separate your brand out from how people might feel about airlines in general? Is that a problem? I don't think so. I don't think you need to do that. Uh, what you want to do is provide the customer with a positive experience, and you have to understand that, it, that it's the airline's customer, it's your customer, the city is involved, and, and if something goes wrong, uh, y'all going to get the blame whether you had anything to do with the problem or not. So, so really it's in everybody's interest to work together and make that a positive experience. Mm -hmm. Make that customer happy, get him on the plane, get him out of here, and everybody comes out better. Dave, same question. Yeah, I, I would say a similar answer. Uh, customer service is paramount, and I think we all have ownership of that throughout the process. I, I would almost say that in a lot of respects, sometimes passengers don't necessarily understand the distinctly different relationship between the airline and the airport. And so when that lost bag happens, we get a call as well at the airport about the lost bag because they just view it as an airport-related item, not necessarily just an airline-related item. Well, then, then, do you do you have do you do you both share some level of frustration when some of these uh, very public issues happen with airlines, not just losing bags, but the way that the public is perceived as being treated by the airlines? What? what let me ask you it this way: What frust what frustration do you have that the airlines should be doing X? What would you tell them to do differently? Uh, well, that that's a that's a, a trick question. Uh, I think uh, looking at their financial record for the last 20 years, I'd probably run the whole airline differently. But uh, they need to understand that they're in the customer service business just like we are. Don't and, you think they know that? Well, uh, no, I don't. I think, uh, I think they get focused internally on themselves, uh, and, and I think they, you know, they, they're trying to make money, and if you, if you 
focus all your effort on trying to make money, more than likely you're not going to get there. You need to focus on producing a good product, and then the money will come. Uh, you know, I would agree that there, the challenge, I think, for the carriers today in trying to reduce uh, expenses in order to increase bottom line or at least try to maintain some level of profitability, which has been very tough for the air carriers since deregulation, is uh, is driving them to do some things that are absolutely not customer-oriented. While they're, we've moved into a technology age, and there's a lot of folks that really like that technology piece of interaction with self-service kiosks and being mm -hmm. able to do things online, when everything uh, goes into a disaster mode because of a weather condition um, and people can't rebook a flight uh, and then can't find uh, anyone at the customer service desk in order to get some help, those are some real issues. So I think, you know, again, it does come back to that customer service piece, and I think there's a fine balance between automation and actually have a, having a person there that somebody can interact with and talk to, and I think that's something that a lot of the airlines have really gotten away from. And Dave, let's stay with that for a second, because when, when, when a flight is missed or there's a storm and all of a sudden the population in an airport swells dramatically, how, ha how have dynamics like that changed the way that you plan the growth of your airport, knowing that it's different than it, or maybe it is, is it different than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago now? Well, I think it is in some regards. I mean, I think we all find ourselves uh, doing more on the food and beverage and retail side and providing amenities for passengers within the terminal to deal with some of those uh, special situations. I think we have to pay more attention uh, to delayed flights and, and what's occurring because, unfortunately, in reductions in seat capacity by the airlines over the years, they don't have available seats to be able to reaccommodate a lot of those passengers because of a delayed or a canceled flight. Uh, that ends up leaving passengers in our terminals longer. Uh, which means we have to uh, deal, obviously, with maybe a little bit uh, uh, more of the customer service problem that's created uh, by those delays mm -hmm. and cancellations. So, Jerry, mm -hmm. how do you think about pl when you plan, and, and Charlotte Douglas is in the midst of a major renovation, and, and how do you think about a huge transient population, not just uh, hourly but daily, that comes through? Are we going to have a mall? Are we going to make it more of an area where... When you got people moving through there, how do you think differently about your planning going forward? Well, you, you have to keep it efficient because you have to keep people, get people from one airplane to another. Right. <clears throat> but you, you need to provide what the marketplace wants, what the customer wants, and that's uh, retail opportunities. It's, it's food and beverage. Nobody wants to wait anymore. I want it all. I want it right now. And if something bad happens to me, it's somebody else's fault. Uh, you can say that's not fair, but that doesn't get you anywhere. You just have to understand that's that's the environment uh, that we live in. The airlines have shed a tremendous number of jobs. Uh, most everybody in the industry has taken a pay cut, mm -hmm. and that's made it much more difficult, along with the overloaded airplanes, for them to, to deal with people. Well, so you the other night we had 500 people spend the night in the terminal that were dumped on us at the last minute, uh, because some airplanes got in and then a storm and they couldn't get back out. And uh, we just have to step up and take care of them. So how do you do that? Well, we call the our big international uh, concourse out there the dormitory uh, late at night, and we put out cots and blankets and water and keep people over, keep our people over, because uh, usually the airline people have gone home. <laughs> And you have to pick up the kind of the slack. Well, I can't, you know, it's our building. We can't go home. We can't turn out the lights and go home. Right. It's like somebody walking into an ER at a hospital. You can't just shut the door. We can't, we can't walk out. So I, I guess what, what do you think is misunderstood about the airport, not the airline, but the airport? Well, I think as it relates to, if we're talking specifically about the airport-airline relationship uh, uh, in that regard, I, I think it's that we are essentially in our business a landlord, um, not in some respects unlike uh, a mall. We are a transportation conduit of moving people from train or rubber tire to airplane and, and back the other way. Um, uh, so, you know, we are a connection point. Uh, we're an integral part of the community from an economic development standpoint. Um, you know, airports are a critical uh, cog in that economic engine for, for growth. So uh, I think that's something that sometimes we maybe don't talk enough about. Uh, without an airport, mm -hmm. what would a lot of communities be? You know, what would 
Greenville, Spartanburg uh, be as a community if it didn't have uh, an airport that could attract uh, corporate headquarters and other businesses to the community. Um, and in order to do that, you need to be able to have the flexibility to travel uh, and get places that you need to be around, the, not only around the country, but around the world. Mm -hmm. So, Jerry, how do, how do you know, how do you measure the success of your airport or any airport? Well, we, we only have two goals. That's to produce the highest quality product at the lowest possible cost. And, and we, that's a drill for all of my people all of the time. They need to stay focused on that. So, you know, you know we practice that a lot. We teach that a lot. Uh, we rehearse. And, and we stress not just to the people that work for me, but for all the other people, there are 20,000 jobs inside defense, that, uh, that we're here to take care of the passenger. This is a customer service business. And uh, we just put a tremendous amount of effort into it. We measured it. We have uh, a firm that comes in every six months, uh, takes uh, customer surveys, uh, measures their response, we look at surveys like J.D. Power mm -hmm. and other surveys that are done industry-wide. Uh, keep track of airports that we consider uh, comparable. Our goal is to be number one, period. Anything short of that is the first loser. So the, the question I asked you right before the lights came up was, is an airport supposed to be profitable? Airports are not, in theory, supposed to be uh, profitable. They are supposed to be self-sustaining. Now, it, I learned my economics from my grandmother, and, and she taught me that you, you can never make too much money, but you can lose too much money rather easily. And if you come up $1 short, you have a problem, and it's your problem. If you have too much money, it's real easy to get rid of it. So we, we design our systems to make the money that the market will yield. And then that determines what we can build, what services we can provide, and, and what we can do. Mm -hmm. Dave, same question. Are you supposed to be profitable? How do, how do you think about the balance sheet and the income statement on your on your? Yeah, I, I think we skirt around sometimes this issue as airports and quasi-public agencies right. of, of whether that word profit is a bad word. Um, I think we have to be profitable at the end of the day. You, you don't want to just balance the budget and not be able to put money into reserve accounts and to fund balance uh, uh, for future needs. Uh, I think uh, Greenville Spartanburg International has, has done a tremendous job at this over the years and has put us in a position uh, soon here to deliver a $100 million terminal renovation and improvement project uh, using a combination of cash and, and some grant funds associated with that without having to borrow any money. So, you know, there's... Uh, uh, I think there's a need to uh, to be able to collect dollars um, in order to do capital programs down the road. Uh, as we look to the future, we don't know what the federal grant programs are going to look like in aviation. Uh, we don't know necessarily what the bond markets are going to look like mm -hmm. uh, as we move forward. And, and I think it's even more important that when we look at a P&L statement uh, that we're generating a reasonable bottom line number at the end of that P&L in order to make sure that uh, we can be uh, generally in control of our destiny to provide the facilities that are needed to continue to grow the airport and provide the services to the traveling public. So, so how does this whole how does this whole sense of austerity that we have now in the public arena how does that impact the way that you budget, the way that you plan, the way that you argue for? Yes, we need an issue for this runway or this expansion. How does that change the way you think or, or promote, Jerry? Well, by federal law, money generated on the airport has to stay on the airport. So it's not so much arguing for somebody else to give you money. It's being able to show the business case that if you take mm -hmm. this money and invest it here, it will generate this revenue, which will be more than adequate to repay the bonds. That's the way you sell bonds and the only way an airport can sell bonds. So, it, so who is an airport beholden to? The, the urban center, the federal government, the authority over the airport, what do, what drives it? Now my answer to that would be uh, the airport is beholden to the people. It belongs to the people, uh, the taxpayers, well, the citizens, not the taxpayers, the citizens of Charlotte own the Charlotte airport. It has never cost them one penny, and they're not at risk for having to pay for it. Nevertheless, they are the owners of the, of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. David? Um, I, you know, I would concur. It's the community's airport, um, and whether that's a individual, you know, city jurisdiction or county jurisdiction, or in our case, since we sit and reside in between uh, on the on the line, and, and actually part of our property at the airport sits in Greenville County, and, and the other in Spartanburg County. 
you know, we do view ourselves as truly a regional asset and we are the region's airport. I think at the same time, uh, I was going to say yes to all of those questions that you asked because because we do take federal money in some regards. We are beholden to the federal government in the sense of uh, uh, grant assurances and other things that we have to comply with at the end of the day uh, when we take those dollars. But I think it ought to be clear, too, as, as Jerry indicated, uh, you know, we don't take any uh, local tax dollars uh, at GSP, as most airports don't uh, do that. And even the dollars that we get from the federal government are all generated by user fees that are charged in the industry. When you buy an airline ticket, you pay a ticket tax. That goes into a trust fund, and we're able to uh, derive grant dollars out of that. So uh, those dollars don't come out of general uh, uh, taxes, uh, general fund dollars uh, out of the federal government, and, and most of us don't uh, get any general fund dollars from our local jurisdictions either. So, so to kind of, kind of back into an issue about deregulation, the airlines went through deregulation. Would the airports ever go, go through a deregulation? Would they be maybe cut loose? Do they need to be cut loose from the from the feds? Oh, I would I would uh, I would say that they are cut loose, uh, especially uh, uh, Dave's airport, which is uh, an airport authority and uh, independent airport authority. It's operating just like a business, uh, mm -hmm. not not government. I would take a little bit of exception about we use federal dollars. Those dollars are generated by the users, uh, sent to Washington, and then they send a portion back and call it a grant. But I think that's user dollars, not federal mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, try to get a lot of people kind of scratch their heads when they try to get their head around what an airport, how an airport is run. And I, I, I suspect on some level you probably all kind of like the fact that you're out there in some bit of an enigma and just running and, and doing it pretty successfully. Um, how did Jerry? How did how did GSP get Southwest and we didn't, or at least Charlotte didn't? Well, I don't think GSP got Southwest. I think I think Southwest started service at GSP. I think it's a misconception to say that airports or cities get airlines. Uh, mm -hmm. Airlines put their flights where they think they can make the most money. They are private businesses. Mm -hmm. They are designed to generate money for their taxpayers. So uh, that's that's how that works. Uh, we will also we we also have Southwest because Southwest has bought Airtran. Mm -hmm. So does so that begs the question: How do how do airports <clears throat> solicit that business, or is there any soliciting? Can you go out, Dave, and do you go out and actively say? You know, we really want more uh, JetBlue flights in here. We want a JetBlue flight in here. Or is that something where you they know that they can come to you, but there's really no progressive nature on your part? Well, Jerry and I will disagree on this one because I, I thank you uh, uh, in the recruitment effort of Southwest uh, at GSP. Um, that was a 15-year process. Um, that, that process started all the way back in, in the mid-'90s. Uh, Southwest came and visited the community in the early 2000 time frame. 9-11 occurred. Uh, times got tough for the airlines. Uh, it didn't work at that time. Uh, the commission and, and the local community came out again in, in early 2009, started that process with Southwest. I came on board at the airport in July of 2009, and, and we did a lot of work with Southwest. I, I would agree, ultimately, the carrier is going to make the final decision on whether they can be profitable in the market. But I do think in today's environment, when we talk about aircraft being able to be put anywhere around the country, we're all fighting for those aircraft in our communities or that new carrier mm -hmm. in our community and trying to get them there. And, and I think what's become more and more important, it's not just about uh, showing that they can be profitable, but that the community is growing, uh, the population base is growing, uh, the business uh, community is growing, and that community is going to be there to support that new service, not only today, but, but out into the future. And, and we know that that was a uh, a very big thing that uh, we were able to represent and show a passion in the upstate in <clears throat> trying to recruit a carrier like Southwest. And, mm -hmm. and so I do think there's a lot that goes into it. Um, ultimately, it comes down to a couple of factors, though, and that really is, uh, you know, if with the aircraft that they're putting into the markets they want to serve, can they charge a fare that they can be profitable at the end of the day? And I would agree with Jerry that typically what they're going to do is they're going to look at markets where they can create the highest yield, highest profit margin in order to put those aircraft. But but in today's environment, as growth is occurring, you're, we're competing all across the nation for, for those additional flights and those aircraft. Mm -hmm. So it's very important um, that the message 
is out there as to what your community and what your airport has to offer. So, so Jerry, how do you, how do you recruit or how do you manage around a, a one dominant airline in the case of Charlotte, it's U.S. Airways, but how do you manage around that, still keep that U.S. Airways uh, franchise uh, pleased and profitable and happy with their gates, but, but still get the competitive flights that you might feel that you need? Uh, very simply, the highest quality product at the lowest possible cost. Uh, when when Lufthansa was considering uh, starting service back in Charlotte, uh, they asked us for subsidies. Mm -hmm. What can we do for them? We showed them what our landing fee rate is. We showed them what their rental rate is. Uh, we showed them the airport and and the quality of the service that we provide there. And that was it. And they made their decision. Now, is does that mean... Now, tell me what you mean by that, Jerry, because how, how, does, how, does, how does an airport work when it comes to economic development? Do you work with the regional authorities on that, like the Charlotte Regional Partnership or the state economic development? We work with all of those uh, uh, people who are out there uh, in economic development trying to get new businesses here. Uh, major businesses want to see the international airport, and they want to know what the, what's going on there, what's going to go on there. Mm -hmm. That's important to business. Uh, most most big businesses now are, are global businesses, and you can't do business if you can't get there from here. So that's that's very important to them. Uh, airlines will will ask you for the world. It's just like a used car lot. <laughs> and if you've got a good product, uh, you don't have to subsidize your product. If you don't have a good product, you might subsidize your product. My observation is when the subsidy's gone, so is the airline. Mm -hmm. So who, who do you two look at? Jerry, who do you look at and say, you know, that airport's doing it right. They've, they've got it down. Their model's good. They've got good credibility. They're moving their flights. People are going through there. They're on the upswing. We won the Eagle Award for the best airport uh, given by the International Air Transport Association. Mm -hmm which is the international group that kind of makes the rules for airlines flying around the world. Best airport, the international group, I think that makes us the best airport in the world. And seventh busiest in the U.S.? Seventh busiest in the U.S. How many people go through Charlotte Douglas? We'll have 40, 40 million people this year coming in and going out, total passengers. And, and David, who do you look at and say, God, those guys are doing it right? And don't dare say Charlotte will be sitting next to you. <laughs> well, I won't. I, would, I won't. Uh, otherwise, I'd be patting Jerry on the back. And they, um, no, they, they obviously do a great job in Charlotte. But I think it's for us, it's a mix. Um, you know, I don't know that I've found one airport that does it all well. And, and I think at GSP, it's one of the things that we're looking to do. We're, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to go through a major terminal renovation and uh, expansion. Mm -hmm. In that process, um, we want to be looked at as the airport that people come to see when they're looking for how it should be done. I would tell you from a financial standpoint, uh, in my opinion, at least at our size airport, and there are differences obviously between an airport the size of Charlotte Douglas and the size of Greenville Spartanburg, um, but for an airport of our size, I don't think there's an airport that's uh, done the financial side better than Greenville Spartanburg International Airport. And, and that's a uh, kudos to our airport commission and the staff that had been there for, for a long, long mm -hmm. time before I came on board. So, so I think there's things we do well. There's things we can improve. I don't know that there, again, is one location or one airport that does everything right. So I think we look to uh, bits and pieces of what people have done around the country in hopes that we can assemble the perfect model, so to speak, uh, as we continue to move ahead and, and expand and, and grow. Do you have $100 million renovation going on? We do, about $100 million, uh, in terminal renovation. We're in a uh, pretty large land use development uh, planning project right now on how we're going to move forward and develop the 3,500 acres around the, around the airport. We have an uh, air traffic control tower we're looking mm -hmm. to relocate uh, at this point in time, so we're working for, with the Federal Aviation Administration on that. Um, so a lot of good and positive things going on. And uh, part of it's in response to just a need. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of work done at the airport uh, since really 1989 or 1990, so yeah. it's been, been a while. Um, but it's also uh, in response to what we assumed was going to happen with Southwest Airlines, and that's that we're now accommodating 50% increases in passenger traffic on a month-over-month -month basis year over year. And uh, so, so we know we need to be paying attention to what's yeah. going on. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, good job on both. Did you fly up? Did you fly to Charlotte from Greenville? No, Sorry. I drove. Okay. Smart man. <laughs> that says something. Thanks for being on the program. Thank Jerry, you. always nice to see you. My pleasure. Congratulations. Uh, good night.
major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King & Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. Additional funding provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services. With more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by viewers like you. Thank you. You may write us at Carolina Business Review, 3242 Commonwealth Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205.